Justin, we have a podcast. Diving, diving deep. deep. Diving deep into all things Texas. Both on and off the field. Here's Sean Pendergast. And Pro Football Hall of Famer, the General. Sean McClain. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to Utopia. So uh, it's no regular season, but as far as preseason goes, there's a lot of moving parts right now with the Houston Texans that we want to get into with you here as we record our first episode of the week. My name is Sean Pendergast, one half of Payne and Pendergast Sports Radio 610, and joined as always by the Hall of Famer, my good friend and our senior columnist at SportsRadio610.com, John McClain. John, how we feeling? Terrible. Astros stink. Texans stunk it up. It was a bad weekend for yeah. sports in Houston. My yeah, it was goodness. It, it was a it was a rough one. I guess the one saving grace is that the Texans game didn't count. Um, but you're right. Saturday night was uh, Saturday night and Sunday were were tough ones. We'll we'll touch on the Astros. We got I got a little Astros built into some for real or fugazis for us a little later, John. But let's dig into the the Texans here, and we'll get into the joint practices or the now canceled joint practices and what this week holds for them in a second. But let's you and this is the first time you and I have sat down since the game on Saturday, um, since the second of the two joint practices on Thursday. And I figure we could do this four stock up, four stock down style like you and I like to do. And we can encompass the joint practices into this if you want to, or it can be just the game. We'll you can go whatever direction you want to, but four stock up and four stock down from what we'll call the Miami Dolphin experience. Um, while they were here, and as always, John, you are the uh, you, you are you're the uh, the senior member in the Hall of Famer here, so the honor is yours, my friend. It's going to be real hard to fi- find four stock up based on that miserable performance. But the best was C.J. Stroud on his second series. First series was a disaster. Get to the one yard line, you don't score anything. And then uh, the second series, though, he looked just like a veteran. Five of six, fifty two yards, zipping the ball on time, out routes, slant routes perfectly, got rid of it quick, made all the right decisions, and he might end up with a touchdown. Problem was uh, he threw a perfect pass over the middle for Noah Brown, would have been a first down, I think, from the Miami 17, and Xavier Howard, one of the best uh, defensive backs ever to play at Baylor, sick him. Mm-hmm. He reached in at the last instant and made a great play, but everybody had to feel good about Stroud's performance and we would have liked to have seen more, but they didn't have the ball for 20 minutes because the defense was so horrendous. So I would say C.J. Stroud, everybody has to feel so good about that one series because it was certainly better than anything you showed in the first game. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, John, my, this is where I'm at on C.J. Stroud right now. At this stage of the preseason, at this early stage of his career, is that I don't really care about I, I could care less about the final score of the game, obviously. Um, I want to have five or six moments during Stroud's performance in these preseason games, and I guess this would encompass two quarters, um, where I can say to myself, okay, that's why they took him with the second overall pick. You know, that now, okay, that throw right there, that throw right there. And John, to your point, I thought on the drive where it ended in the field goal, um, that he had he had a, a handful of throws like that. He had back to back fourteen yard throws to a, a slant to Nico Collins, a rollout to Noah Brown. Um, I thought the best throw that he had of the night on the scoreboard or on the game log. It just looks like he converted a third and seven with an eleven yard pass to Robert Woods. But you saw it just like I did. He's on the right hash. He's throwing it all the way across the left hash to the sideline in a microscopic window to get that ball in here. And he just made that look super, super easy to convert a key third down on that drive. Right before that play, he was kind of, he had pressure in his face and he was able to get Dalton Schultz the ball to make it third and manageable. Um, Yeah, it was a rough start. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in stock down. It was a rough start for CJ Stroud, but the fact that that was the next drive that he came back with that drive was able to put some points on the board. And I thought, John, maybe the best play that he had uh, of the entire evening was an incompletion because it was a drop by Noah Brown. But on third down, towards the end of the half, he was able to read a, 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 an unchecked defender coming at him, rolled rolled out to his left. The defender knees buckled, so he did a great job of putting that guy on the ground. 
and then running away from his arm through a dime to Noah Brown, that if Noah Brown catches that, the Texans have first and 10 at about the 37 or 38-yard line of Miami, and that drive's still going. So um, I like the way he spread the ball around to a bunch of different receivers. Uh, I, I like that he recovered from the early kind of deer in the headlight stuff with the delay of game. Um, I'm with you. I, I'm, I'm a that performance was to me. I'm forget about the scoreboard, just the things that you saw him doing, the throws you saw him make. That's a big green arrow up for CJ Stroud for me. Absolutely. All right, my first stock up, John. I'm going to tie it into CJ Stroud. I thought the offensive line it helps when you have your starters in there, but they played much better in pass protection this time around. They couldn't run the football at all. But as far as keeping C.J. Stroud upright and allowing us to at least have these moments that you and I are talking about, we couldn't talk about any of this stuff against New England because he was pressured literally on every drop back that he had with the second string offensive line in front of him. This time around, at least according to Pro Football Focus, none of the five offensive linemen allowed a single QB pressure. Now, we don't know what assignments are. Maybe some of the guys that came free, blitzes and whatnot, were the responsibility of offensive linemen. But the point being is that C.J. Stroud had a whole lot more time to – to read the defense and to get his feet set this week than he did last week. Um, so I'm going to give the offensive line a stock up this week, at least in pass pro. When I went back and watched the replay several times of, of certain plays, Juice Scruggs looked really good. The rookie center, he was knocking people off the ball. I looked up one time and he had somebody who was knocking backward and then buried him. And when we asked D'Amico Ryans on Monday, about Scruggs, the first thing he said was he got everybody set the way they were supposed to be, he did all the things mentally you want the center to do, and then he he looked good physically. And uh, I don't think, based on the small sample size, that he's going to be an issue, but uh, he did look good. All right, what's your next stock up, John? Will Anderson Jr., one play he showed, well, we all knew what he's capable of, why Nick Casario traded up to get him to third overall pick when he just obliterated the running back Ahmed and just crushed him, reached up, sacked Skylar Thompson, stripped the ball, and, of course, everybody celebrated. I think we're going to be able to see that on a pretty consistent basis. But because of plays like that, he's going to start to get a whole much, a lot more attention and I uh, can't wait to see him when he gets in regular season. Well, good. Hopefully some of the guys along the front can make teams pay if they're going to double-team him or send extra guys at him. Jonathan Grenard had a couple nice plays in that game uh, on Saturday as well. Um, it was interesting. We were talking about the the Will Anderson play um, this morning. Seth and I were talking about it on Payne and Pendergast. Um, and Seth pointed out, if you go – I'm not to beat pro football focus into the ground, but Will Anderson had the highest pro football focus grade, not just the sack, but of – performance in all the snaps he was in across any of the rookie edge rushers across the league this weekend. So it wasn't just that one play. He was, he was doing things. He was doing good things throughout the, throughout the, uh, the game while he was in there. Seth said the other thing he really liked about Will Anderson is that while he's playing a position where they, they really are kind of freeing him up to go, you know, see ball, get ball kind of thing is that you can see him look down the line before the snap to make sure he's he's reading his run keys as well. So it's not that he's just this maniac who's running straight for the quarterback. Like He's very disciplined as far as what his overall assignment is. Um, I'm really I'm excited about Will Anderson. John, we had him on the postgame show. He's awesome. <laughs> he's, he's a, he is a great kid. He's a lot of fun. I hope he's looking down to make sure he wasn't lining up in the neutral zone, which is the dumbest penalty in football. That was a clowny special back in the day, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, last stock up. And you're right, it's hard to find four in this game. <clears throat> I'm going to give it to Mike Boone. Uh, Mike Boone, the third string running back who came in and did some good things on an offense that did very few good things throughout the afternoon or throughout the evening, especially in the second half when Davis Mills was in there. Um, Boone showed a little wiggle while he was in there. He showed an ability to catch the ball, run with the ball. Um I think he's going to end up making this team. You know, we're starting to get to the point in training camp here where we can really see where the battle lines are drawn for spots, you know, call it spots 40 through 53 on the roster. You know, every position group probably has one or two guys that are battling to be the last guy in that position group. Um, Dario Gumbawale and the Dokes kid didn't play in this game because they were banged up. So Mike Boone had a chance in the second half to, uh, to do some things. And I thought considering he had that, offensive line in front of him the second string offensive line and third string for the Texans which we know is not good um I thought he did some good things so I thought I think if he's trying to make this team I thought 
And I know special teams are going to factor in, and Daria Gumbawale plays special teams and so on and so forth. I feel I think they can find an 11th special teamer before, you know, having – I'd rather have somebody who's an experienced back like Boone who has shown some, some, some burst here in camp. I'd rather have him as the third running back with him being, you know, one hit, bad hit away from being in there for Singletary or Pierce than worry about who the 10th or 11th special team guy is going to be running down on punt unit. Well, I talked to Danny Barrett, the running backs coach. He said they have to find special teams that he can play, and they will because he's the third back's always got to play him. I thought you might mention Denzel Perryman. He had the yeah. interception. He had a sack in the first game. You know, the veteran middle linebacker had injuries last year. Two years ago, he's in the Pro Bowl and led the Raiders in tackles. And now because of him, they moved Henry Toa Toa outside instead of in the middle. So that shows you how bad they want to get Toa Toa on the field. Yeah. Toa Toa struggled a little bit, but uh, that's that, that's to be expected, I suppose. Um, yeah, you're right. They love Toa Toa. All right, so those are four stock up. Den, Den, Denzel Perryman is a bonus one. I will accept, John. That's a good one. Um, what's your first uh, stock down? The buffet is much more full for this part of the uh, podcast. The run defense. I know we've never said anything negative about the Texans' run defense. So um, – this would now I know it's preseason. The run defense looked good in the first game against New England, but in this game, the run defense was awful. Besides giving up a 65 yard run, ended up giving 207 yards. That's got to drive D'Amico Ryan's crazy. 49ers were second last year, they were seventh the year before. Texas have been pathetic for the last four years, by far the worst in the NFL last season. And I know D'Amico talks about, well, it's got to get better. Well, yeah, it does have to get better, but uh, it was not good. And because of that run defense, it helped them control the ball for 40 minutes and kept the Texans from having the ball enough to look at C.J. Stroud more. Yeah, they, they yeah, I, I mean, the, the box score was hideous for this game, no doubt about it. Um, I, I'll dovetail, mine will kind of dovetail off of that, John, because the run defense is certainly a big part of this. But just, and, and D'Amico touched on this. My first stock down is just situational football across the board, you know, starting with the, the red zone after the Denzel Perryman interception, just mistakes there with the delay of game on third and goal from the one. You basically forfeited seven points right there. Now, in the regular season, they probably kick a field goal on fourth and goal from the six. So you, you, you come away with three, but you're supposed to come away with seven. When you get down to the one yard line with Damian Pierce, you're supposed to come away with seven points. The miscommunication on fourth down there between CJ Stroud and Dalton Schultz, which I've I've been told by somebody who is an expert at these things. I'll just say that it, that was a Schultz, that was a Schultz issue, not a Stroud issue on that play. Um, but either way, that's it's it's a team thing. They were bad in the red zone there. They were bad, they were horrible on third down on both sides. Horrible defensively on third down. Nine of fifteen they allowed. They allowed two of two on fourth down, and then offensively they were two of twelve on third down and converting. So. They were bad on third down on both sides of the football. And then end of half, you know, the Noah Brown had the drop in the last two minutes there that we talked about a little bit earlier on that really nice rollout by CJ. And then the Dolphins are just trying to run the clock out, I think, at the end of the half with a minute to go. I mean, they're handing the ball off on second down at their own 25-yard line or something like that. And Salvan Ahmed goes for 65 yards, you know, Um so just situ the, the situations that head coaches harp on all the time, third down, red zone, last two minutes of the half, last two minutes of the game. The, te the only one the Texans were good at was the last two minutes of the game because it didn't matter at all. <laughs> they, they, were, they were bad in all those other areas. So situational football, John. Situ if you're, you can be bad between the 20s, but if you're good situationally and get off the field, you can win football games. They didn't do that on Saturday. Shocking. We've never seen that before. My next yeah. one? is D'Amico Ryans. By his own admission, he said that it was on him. You know, fans used to go crazy when they hear Bill O'Brien and Gary Kubiak say that. And, of course, it wasn't on him. But third and goal at the one, the clock's running out. He admitted on Monday he should have called a timeout to help C.J. Stroud, and he didn't. But, you know, he's a first-time head coach. He'll – mistakes that he makes like that, he won't make in the future. And because uh, coaches have to have learning experience – as well as the players, and everybody loves Miko. And uh, and we all think he's going to be really good. Every team in the league that had an opening wouldn't have wanted to interview him if they didn't think he had did as well. 
But we always think about players learning. Coaches have to learn too. And I'll guarantee you if it's third and goal at the one, another, another time the clock's about to run out, he'll call timeout. Yeah, my last one, I, he, I, I heard him in that press conference today. And I, he, yeah, that, that, that's the stuff that is, you're right. D'Amico's Q rating is still super high here in town. He is incredibly popular. He's done nothing yet to diminish his popularity. I know that the folks like you that are all the press conferences aren't wild about some of his answers to things that he's a little, not, maybe not you personally, John, but I know, boy, there's some people that he, he hasn't named a starting quarterback yet. He hasn't said CJ's the starter. So it's such a big deal. Oh no. Oh no. And, and he's, you know, he tends to be pretty close to the vest when it comes to injuries and things like that. I don't think he's alone in that. I think that's just what coaches do. Those are the things that will eat away most quickly at the goodwill that D'Amico Ryans has. Game management, simple game management mistakes that end up costing the team points. That's what that's what will do it faster than anything. He can have whatever demeanor in the press conference he wants to. I think people are used to that. When it's when you're doing things that are literally costing you points and ultimately could cost you games, that'll be what eats at his goodwill faster than anything else. And that was a problem the last two years, especially two years ago. But we know this: no matter what happens, Nico isn't going to be a third in a row, uh, one and done, because he's there for the long term with his six-year contract. And uh, and it wouldn't have been as noticeable if it hadn't have just been on the one. Yeah, but uh, I don't expect that to happen again. No, I, I don't either. My last one, John, just pretty simple. The the as good as the offensive line was keeping CJ Stroud clean, you know, they they couldn't get anything going in the run game when it mattered or in the first half. You know, you you would hope with as much as they have invested in that offensive line, when you get first and goal at the seven against or whatever it was, the six or the seven, and whatever uh and you're going up against a defense, it's missing Christian Wilkins, you know, one of their best interior defensive linemen. <clears throat> you the hope is that you line up. And you can get go get, you know, go go get seven yards. Now, granted, the delay a game penalty, they probably end up punching it in. But even when they had the ball at times during the next drive, you know, CJ's in a second and 13 because Damian Pierce gets blistered in the backfield. So my my uh second stock down or fourth stock down total is the the running game offensively, because we know this team wants to lean on the run offensively, John. They've said that. It's gotta be better. On the seven, Pierce ran for one, then he ran for five, third and one. Thought they'd give it to him again, but cut for the delay. But when Pierce went down last year, you know, he missed the last four. He missed almost all the one where he got hurt. So basically he missed five. I'm confident that they're going to be able to run the ball better as long as he's healthy. And I expect Devin Singletary will primarily be a pass catcher, but he should, you know, he should be touching the ball on runs probably five times a game. Because it's so hard today. When you play 17 games, it's so hard for a back to stay healthy for all. Yep, no doubt. Um, I guess the good, the other bit of good news, John Titus Howard, it looks like he's out of his cast. And D'Amico wouldn't give up too much about <clears throat> where Titus is at right now, except to say that he's progressing nicely. Said that earlier today in his press conference. I don't know, I guess reading between the lines and seeing he's got his cast off, I know you're not a doctor, John, but how optimistic are you that he's out there against Baltimore three weeks from now? Well, I'm guessing that he can play with a pad, his, his uh, right hand padded, and that the cast come off, came off as a great sign, but uh, they'll have to see. You know, George Fant didn't play bad. He is definitely right now the swing tackle. Since Charlie Eck had not done squats since last season, I'm guessing he's going to start the season on PUP which I can't remember how many games he has to miss. I think it's and six. Six games, and then he can have a three weeks once he's activated to, to, to get ready. And he may need a lot of time to get ready because when Charlie Heck comes back, he will have had no contact whatsoever. Yeah, well, he and his the, the, the injury he's listed as, I know he had some surgery in the offseason, but I saw some report that listed it as a foot. Um the bottom line is, I mean, you've been out there at practice just like I have. He's not doing anything right now out of practice that would indicate he's getting ready to play. You know, sometimes there's guys that are working out off to the side, and you can see, like, okay, that guy's running cone drills over there. Like, he's, you know, Chase Winovich is an example. When he was when he was on the PUP list to start training camp, that dude had the GPS tracker vest on, and he's, he's over working out on the side field and doing drills and all kinds of stuff. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie may as well be walking around with one of those little baskets that has the water bottles in it and handing it to guys. He, he looks like just a, a gig, like a gigantic intern out there. 
We didn't see him in the off-season program because he wasn't on the field. He was rehabbing. But then since training camp begins, he walks around. He walks fast. He's got no limp. He's got no nothing on his foot or his ankle or his knee, whatever it is. So he looks he looks uh, not as good as his big brother, John, who looks like the mountain <laughs> no, in Game God. of Thrones. But he makes Charlie look small. But Charlie Heck walks, and he doesn't walk slow. And he doesn't walk, doesn't limp. So I can't wait till regular season begins and they have to put out a legitimate injury report. Yeah, we'll see what happens. All right, so that's four. 